Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. The sun was scorching mercilessly, and the July heat was melting the asphalt. Even inside the car, the distinct smell of asphalt lingered. Vico endured the scent for a while, but when invisible cats scratched his throat, he closed the window. However, it only made the situation worse, as there was no air to breathe at all. The man cursed the weather out loud, as well as himself, how much longer will this inferno last? It feels like the celestial bureaucracy decided to eradicate the population of our fragile planet with this heat wave. I'm no better myself. I should have taken the weather into account before embarking on such a long trip. When his bout of dissatisfaction subsided a bit, the man defended his actions. No, I did the right thing after all. Strike while the wind is fair. What if it turns out to be a disappointment again, like last time? I wasted so much time searching, and the result was zero. Vico wasn't bothered by the fact that he combined two idioms into one. In general, he enjoyed experimenting in this field and often entertained his colleagues in the workshop with his witty remarks. Thoughts of work always added positivity. No, Vico didn't consider himself a workaholic and had no intention of burning out at work someday. The secret to his special attitude towards professional duties lay in two key factors. The first one was a good salary, and the second one was a close-knit male team. Vico often caught himself thinking how incredibly lucky he was, despite certain circumstances in his personal life. Not every man his age had an apartment, a car, and a good job. The only problematic aspect was his bachelor life. He had long wanted to start a family, with lots of children, no less. But, to his immense regret, he hadn't met a woman who shared his aspirations yet. A Ferrari of dazzling red colors zoomed by at high speed, and a wave of scorching air rushed into the window that Vico had opened again when he started suffocating from the stale air. He commented on another example of road lawlessness, look at all these rich brats. They think they can do whatever they want. Victor had nothing against the children of the wealthy, but he believed that even they shouldn't forget about the transience of human existence on Earth. He had internalized these simple truths since early childhood, although Vico didn't like to reminisce about that period of his life. There were still about three hours of driving left to reach the small provincial town, which was the last stop on his route. Closer to noon, clouds covered the scorching sun, and it became easier to breathe. Vico fully opened the window and happily exposed his face to the cool breeze. Instantly, a scene from the distant past appeared before his eyes as he stood in the yard with his eyes closed, filled with dread about what would happen next. Vico wasn't lucky with his place of birth or his parents, but he hardly remembered anything from the first years of his existence. The boy, in the true sense of the word, merely existed he didn't live. Along with him, his little sister suffered, whose name he couldn't recall. His mother's face also eluded his memory. When he strained himself, trying to reach the farthest corners of this storage of forgotten memories, two blurred spots emerged. The second image belonged to his stepfather. However, their voices resounded distinctly. Gomez, did you steal another bottle from my stash? Why are you blaming me? Ask your little pup. Maybe he hid it. Look how he's looking like a little wolf cub. Vico remembered that scene well. His mother, swaying, rose from the table and moved towards him. Vico, is Uncle Gomez telling the truth? Did you take the soda bottle? Tell me where it is, or your mommy will die. The stepfather laughed unpleasantly. Lucia, why are casting pearls before him? Shake him properly, he'll tell you things he doesn't even know. Encouraged by the man, the mother loomed over the child. Vico became very scared and shouted, Mama, please don't hit me. I didn't drink your soda. Uncle Gomez openly enjoyed this scene. And when the situation reached its peak, he amiably said, That's enough, Lucia. Leave the kid alone, or he'll have an accident from fear. He's not responsible. Come closer to me. I'll show you a magic trick. With a discreet movement, the man took out a bottle from his sleeve and uncorked it to the enthusiastic cries of the mother. Damn magician. 
I almost punished the child for nothing. Look, he's still shaking from fear. It's okay, he'll laugh now. Right, Vico? Uncle Gomez first showed the boy an empty palm, then clenched his hand into a fist and blew on it. Abracadabra, the girl on the beach lost her bra. The stepfather opened his palm again, and the boy saw two caramel candies and crumpled wrappers. Here, take them, little one, while Uncle Gomez is still kind. And treat your sister too. When the stepfather was sober, he would sometimes show Vico different card tricks. The six-year-old boy would watch with a mesmerized gaze as the man's skillful hands performed, but he never managed to unravel the secret of the trick. And Uncle Gomez, satisfied with the impression he made, would say, They taught me this in prison. There, kid, you find some clever folks, even candidates of science. A tragic day also left its mark in Vico's consciousness when he and his little sister ran away from their mother's drunken company. Many unfamiliar people had gathered in their house then. Uncle Gomez was very angry and ordered, Lucia, take your bastard somewhere. They won't let me rest, always getting in my way. And the girl won't stop crying on top of it all. Mother was still in a coherent state and began to object. They're not bothering anyone. They sit quietly in the kitchen and play. Besides, where am I supposed to send them? Let them go to their grandmother. Yeah, right. If I send them to that viper in Bossam, she'll immediately report me to the authorities. So what? Well, Gomez, if that happens, they'll strip me of my parental rights. That's a disaster. Forgive me, but you're about as much of a mother as I am a Chinese tea leaf collector. Let them take away your rights, at least then you'll be completely free. And how will I survive? Have you thought about that? I receive welfare benefits for both of them as a single mother. I don't have much hope in you, Gomez, because today you're here, and tomorrow you'll be back in prison. The man jumped up and clenched his fists, moving towards the mother. Why are you blabbering here? Do you want me to shut you up for good? Vico heard everything down to the very last word, but he didn't understand anything. Even now, he didn't understand what made him grab his little sister and run away from home when another argument erupted. Perhaps at that critical moment, his innate intuition, often referred to as a gut feeling, kicked in. But his grandmother and her acquaintances called it a miracle. When the woman saw her grandchildren at the doorstep, she grumbled. Those good-for-nothing drunkards again. Oh, Lucia, Lucia. You've really gone downhill, not thinking about the children. No, it's time to put an end to this nonsense. Tomorrow, I'm going to the authorities. Even in an orphanage, the children will be better off than with such a mother. Even though she's my daughter, I can't bear this any longer. Grandmother expressed all these grievances in one breath. Exhausted from the emotional turmoil, Vico listened, afraid to move because if he showed disobedience, she might kick them out onto the street. But Dona Delgado, despite her stern character, loved and cared for her grandchildren. She washed them, fed them, and put them to bed. However, their sleep didn't last long because they heard shouts from outside. Then there was a loud knock on the window. Anna, wake up. It seems there's a fire in the dead end. Could it be your ruffians causing another Pompeii there? Grandmother got up and threw on her coat over her nightgown. With her head uncovered, she rushed out of the house, saying on the way, Vico, watch over your little sister. I'll go and see what's happened there. Grandmother was gone for a long time, and Vico fell asleep again. She returned when it was already bright outside. Dona Delgado didn't cry, she just crossed herself frequently in front of the icons. Lord, rest their souls and forgive them all their earthly sins. The woman didn't immediately notice that the boy was awake. She approached and sat on the edge of the bed. That's it, my dears, now you're orphans. What misfortune has befallen you, innocent angels? The woman screamed the last phrase in desperation. Her cry woke up the little sister, and she started crying. Grandmother pressed their heads to her chest and began kissing them frantically. It's all right, my darlings. God will help us. 
Don't be afraid, you won't be lost with me. They stayed with their grandmother, Vico, and his little sister. Vico remembered the word funeral, but he couldn't attend the procession. However, their grandmother's sister tried to persuade her. Anya, you can't do that. After all, she's still their mother. Yes, Susanna, I can. You shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but Lucia was a bad mother. She didn't leave anything good behind as a memory, and there's no reason for the child to attend the funeral. Later, I'll take them to her grave. But first, we need to have them baptized. The children can't go without baptism. I just don't know who to ask as godparents. Aunt Susanna eagerly suggested. Ask Nina. I think she won't refuse. Besides, she's family, even if distantly related. She hasn't been able to have her own child, so she can at least take care of the orphans. And they won't be strangers to her. Maybe then the Lord will have mercy on Nina and send her a child of her own. Vico remembered the scent of candles and the long prayer of the priest from the baptism ceremony. His little sister cried throughout while an unfamiliar woman named Nina cradled her in her arms. The adults repeated some words after the priest and made the sign of the cross. The highlight of the ritual for Vico was when they hung a small cross around his and his sister's necks. Grandmother was very pleased that she fulfilled her main mission. Vico overheard her talking to relatives. Now the children will be protected by angels. Aunt Susanna smirked. And who will feed and nourish them? Angels? Dona Delgado slammed her fist on the table. Don't blaspheme in my house. I won't abandon my grandchildren. I'll raise them myself. And by law, orphans are entitled to assistance. Unexpectedly, Aunt Nina intervened in the argument. It was from her that Vico first learned about orphanages in the world. The relative spoke in an unyielding tone. Aunt Anya, they won't let you keep the children. Don't even try to resolve this in your favor. Grandmother protested. I have every right because besides me, there is no one else close to the children among our relatives. Why would they prohibit me from raising my grandchildren? The relative gave grandmother a cold look. The main reason, Aunt Anya, is your age and health condition. Vico will be placed in an orphanage and the little girl will go to a children's home. After these words, Dina Delgado slumped. Nina, what am I supposed to do then? There's nothing you can do. This matter is under special control and no one will allow you to go against the letter of the law. The only thing I can offer you. Well, I talked to my husband and he doesn't mind taking care of the little girl. And what about Vico? Can you separate a sister and brother? Take them both. The crown won't fall off head. I'll be able to visit the children and help as much as I can. In Dona Delgado's voice, there was a plea, but Aunt Nina didn't like the idea. She fidgeted and clumsily explained why she couldn't take both children under her care. Aunt Anya, you see, my husband is a very busy man, and I'm just a free attachment to his persona. And I'm not joking. Everything in our family is decided by Senor Ramos. I could barely convince him to take the girl, so I'm afraid to imagine how he'll react to the suggestion of taking another boy. Vico heard all of this and cried, huddled in a corner of the sofa. He felt hurt that they were talking about him as if he were a doll that could be given away. He couldn't wait for that annoying Aunt Nina to finish speaking and ran up to her. Auntie, you resemble Bruxa, and your Senor Ramos is Nisferatu. I won't even go live with you, even if you beg me. The women stared at the boy, stunned. Aunt Nina was the first to comment on his outburst. You see for yourself, the boy is uncontrollable, and he's only six. What will happen to him in the future? Aunt Susanna tried to defend Vico. It's not surprising with such upbringing. In good hands, the child will improve. Aunt Nina rolled her eyes. Perhaps, but I'm not ready for such challenges. The girl is still very young, and it will be easier for us to train her. Grandmother interrupted her relative. Nina, you can train a kitten to go to the designated place. You can't speak like that about children. And personally, I doubt you'll become a loving mother. 
Personally, I will oppose separating the children. Unfortunately, nobody took grandmother's opinion into account. After a few days, Aunt Nina took the little sister. Vico lived with his grandmother a little longer, but then unfamiliar aunts arrived and took him away in their car. Grandmother cried when she said goodbye to him and whispered, Vico, take care of the cross. Don't lose it accidentally. It will protect you from any harm. During the entire journey, he held the blessed church charm to his chest. He did it so expressively that one of the accompanying women asked kindly, Little one, what are you hiding there in your pocket? The second woman advised her companion, Check what he has there. Who knows what nasty thing he might want to bring into the closed institution. Then we'll be dragged around to the superior's offices because of it. The first woman looked into his eyes and smiled. You'll show me what you have there, won't you? Vico immediately liked this woman because she was kind. He carefully took out a small silver cross on a thin chain from his pocket. The kind official gently patted his head. Thank you. Now you can put it away. Irene, false alarm. The child has a regular cross, no prohibited items. They continued to drive in the car for a long time, and throughout the rest of the journey, Vico thought that he would be very happy if that kind lady wanted to adopt him. But children's dreams don't always reach the heavens, and Vico had to spend two years in an orphanage. He didn't have any fond memories of that period because every day he experienced humiliation from the older children in the institution. Not all caregivers showed kindness and compassion to their charges. The idea of escaping from the orphanage had sprouted in Vico's subconscious from the early days. Of course, a six-year-old boy had little idea of how to execute such a plan. Considering that the children in the institution were under constant supervision, it was almost impossible to do so. But despite the strict regime, there were occasional escapes from the orphanage. However, only older children dared to take such desperate steps, so Vico had to postpone his plan for a more opportune time. He didn't share his intention with anyone. Only once did he blurt out to Ilya that he had a little sister and he wanted to run away to find her. But his unfortunate comrade couldn't keep it to himself and told everything to Cruella. The nickname of the notorious character was given to the night caregiver Sonora Moya, who had a malicious character. Cruella dragged Vico into the corridor and lifted him by the collar of his shirt, making him gasp for breath. But the mentally disturbed woman found pleasure in tormenting the child. So, you little brat, planning to run away? I'll take away your desire. You'll be scared to even go to the toilet. Vico screamed, but no one dared to come to his aid, even though dozens of children witnessed the scene. After satisfying her sadistic desires, Corella went to report the thwarted escape attempt to the director. As the boy was still very young, his punishment was being locked in the infirmary for 10 days. Sonora Moya came every evening to check on him. She stared at him, pressing her face against the glass door. In a fit of wild rage, she shouted, Hey, how are you in there? Haven't changed your mind about running away yet? If it were up to me, I would make you kneel on Brooks for a whole day, then you'd surely become obedient. Cruella added various unpleasant wishes, like may your teeth grow crooked and misaligned. Vico couldn't be rude to her because it would only extend his punishment. So he endured the humiliation, silently swallowing his tears. Only towards the end of his confinement, the nurse caught Sonora Moya in the act during one of her actions. The nurse was shocked by what the staff member, whose duty was to care for the children, was doing. She initially tried to reason with the mentally unstable woman. Sonora Moya, aren't you ashamed? He's just a child, and you're taking out your anger on him. What has this boy done to deserve such treatment? Corella didn't even flinch. Not yet, but he was planning to. And there's no need to pity such a bad seeds because nothing good will come out of them anyway. Can a normal child be born from an alcoholic mother? The genes are already ruined. The only path for them is prison. The nurse started to chase away the caregiver. Stop immediately. I won't allow you to torment a defenseless child. And who do you think you are to make such judgments? 
Cruella resisted and threatened the nurse. Vico heard the nurse say as she escorted the caregiver out the door. I warn you, Sonora Moya, that I will report your outrageous behavior to the director today. Cruella yelled from behind the door. I don't give a damn about your warnings. I work here, and I'll continue to work because no one else would agree to wipe the snout of these premature brats for such a measly salary. That's why there's a constant personnel shortage in orphanages. Most likely, the nurse kept her promise because the cruel caregiver never appeared in the orphanage again. Although Sonora Moya had already made the difficult lives of the young wards even more bitter, Vico didn't confide in anyone anymore. It was his first learned life lesson. But thoughts of his younger sister visited him constantly, especially before bedtime. The boy recalled the unpleasant events and thought, how is my sister doing without me? She's probably being mistreated by Aunt Nina and her husband. The most surprising fact was that Vico couldn't even remember his sister's name. His perpetually drunk mother and stepfather, as well as his grandmother, referred to the little girl as baby or girly. Vico also couldn't recall the name of the town where he was born and where his mother perished in a fire. The image of Dania Delgado, his grandmother, also constantly appeared before the child's eyes. Despite her promises, his grandmother never visited him. Later, he learned from one of the caregivers that his grandmother quietly passed away shortly after the grandchildren were taken away. Life in the orphanage was monotonous, except for those rare occasions when couples would visit to choose a child. On such days, both the older children and the little ones held their breath, hoping to be chosen. But Vico was scared of the fate of ending up with strangers, so he tried to hide as far away as possible to avoid catching the eye of potential parents. He moved to the third grade and completely stopped believing in miracles. He laughed at those children who still dreamed of adoption, saying, Idiots, don't you know that all those mommies and daddies are just pretending to be kind? In reality, they don't want you at all. They'll take you away and then throw you in the trash. Since his opinion was hardly supported by anyone, he had to withstand a barrage of criticism after making such statements. Vico, you're angry because no one chose you. But deep down, you also want to be in a foster family. Even the older kids held the same belief. They, too, believed in their guiding star, dreaming of being part of a healthy and loving family. Vico was at that vulnerable age where he couldn't understand why he rejected the possibility of change in his life. Summer vacation arrived, and many children left the orphanage temporarily. Vico was playing ball with the boys on the sports field when the nurse approached him. Vico, I need you. Let's go see the director. Why? I haven't done anything wrong. Must you commit a misdeed to visit the director's office? Sometimes you're called there for pleasant reasons. The boy waved goodbye to his friends. Guys, keep playing without me. I'll be back soon. The nurse gently nudged him. Soon is unlikely. Puzzled, the boy followed the nurse, lost in speculation, but he couldn't come up with anything concrete. In the office, where he had been only once before, there were two more people besides the director, a man and a woman. When Vico entered and politely greeted everyone, the office's hostess, with feigned cheerfulness, said, And here is our Vico. Well, we can use a more grown-up name, Senor Vidal. So, welcome. The man stood up and extended his hand to the boy. I'm Natal Prieto Santana, and this is my wife, Sonora Prieto. The guest nodded towards the woman, and she also stood up. The director, in her voice filled with joyous excitement, said, Vico, our guests came here specifically to. The man gestured for the head of the institution to be silent. Allow me to say it myself. The office hostess didn't like this dismissive attitude and, without her previous optimism, said, Fine, I won't interrupt. While you have your conversation, I'll go check on things at the kitchen. When she left, Senor Prieto seated Vico next to him and simply said, You see, buddy, we've had a tragedy. Our son passed away from an incurable illness. It happened a long time ago, but he will forever remain in our hearts. At first, my wife and I thought we would live with memories, but then we realized it was wrong. 
Vico gathered his courage and looked the man straight in the eyes. Why is it wrong? Well, because you can't close yourself off in your own sorrow. It only intensifies the feeling of loneliness. And then we thought that we have the power to make someone else happy. Sonora Prieto, who had been silent until now, sat down next to Vico. We visited here several times already. You might not believe it, but when I first saw you, my heart skipped a beat. The boy was surprised. Is it really possible? The woman smiled. It happens, but very rarely, only in special cases. And for Senor Prieto and me, this is one of those special and very important moments. Vico could see the hope and genuine concern in the eyes of these two adults. There was such warmth emanating from them that the boy longed to be embraced by it. He asked softly, Do you want to adopt me? Senor Prieto answered, You understand our intentions. The decision is up to you. If you need time to think, we're willing to wait. No need to wait. You're kind, I can feel it. I agree to become your son, and I'll try my best to listen to you in everything. Sonora Prieto burst into tears and pulled him into a tight hug. Her embrace was as tender as a grandmother's. Vico wanted to sit next to her for a long, long time. Senor Prieto seemed to read his thoughts. Thank you for giving us hope. We'll do our best to be real parents to you. Later, when the initial emotions subsided, Senor Prieto casually said, Fulfilling others' wishes is an unpleasant and harmful activity. We have no intention of suppressing your will. Personally, I believe that it's important to argue because that's where the truth is born. But it should be done in a kind way. Vico didn't understand the purpose of such a lengthy speech. The man noticed his confusion and explained with a smile. Never keep your thoughts and feelings to yourself, no matter what they are. Share your joys and sorrows with us and know that we'll always be there to help you. This reassurance further solidified the boy's conviction that he had won the jackpot of happiness. In September, Vico started at his new school, where he quickly settled in. He didn't tell any of his classmates about his past life, and his adoptive parents praised him for that. Sonora Prieto looked thoughtfully out the window and whispered, You've made a very wise decision. People come in all sorts, some will sympathize with you, while others will be glad to see you suffer. No need to involve strangers in our family affairs. The most important thing is for the three of us to always be happy together. Vico loved being in the Prieto's home. Here, he felt completely safe and comfortable. He had his own room and a desk for studying. In his free time, he could play computer games or attend martial arts training, which Senor Prieto promptly enrolled him in. His adoptive parents didn't demand the impossible from him and never imposed their own opinions. Everything was going well, but the first worrisome sign came at an entirely inappropriate time. Vico had already grown accustomed to his new life when Sonora Prieto said, Vico, Senor Prieto, and I are planning to visit one place, the cemetery. We would really like it if you could accompany us. Of course, you can stay home, but... The boy felt ashamed that this kind woman was asking him such a small favor. I will go with you. The woman smiled, and that familiar expression returned to her face, the one Vico liked the most. She shouted towards the kitchen. Nikita, I talked to Vico. He agrees. Let us know when we should leave. The adoptive father appeared from the kitchen, wearing a satisfied look. I'm ready. We can leave right now. At that moment, the teenager had no idea what awaited him in the next half hour. The grieving parents, their heads bowed in sorrow, walked towards a richly adorned memorial. The entire complex occupied a considerable area, and all the elements were made of black marble. A statue of a boy approximately Vico's age looked directly at him. Vico lowered his gaze slightly and read, Victor Prieto Vargas. The realization burned into the 11-year-old's consciousness, and he blurted out, So your son was also named Vico? Sonora Prieto smiled again. Yes, my dear, and we had hoped to find a boy who would resemble him. Vico shuddered. 
He wanted to run away because he didn't want to be a replica of the deceased. But his adoptive parents were oblivious to their mistake. They had no idea what was happening in the child's soul at that moment. Subsequently, similar events occurred with alarming regularity, and Vico was obliged to accompany his grieving parents to the grave of his predecessor. It was then that he realized these good, kind people didn't love him. The boy from the orphanage served as a peculiar altar for this couple, where they poured their parental love for their deceased child. As he grew older, Victor understood that he was merely a victim brought by fanatical parents in honor of their deceased son. This feeling was so strong that Vico began considering running away again, but he decided not to rush and wait until he reached adulthood. He often locked himself in his room, spending time chatting with peers on social networks. And before going to sleep, he indulged in his thoughts, as he had done before, once I finish school, I'll leave this house. I don't need their money. I won't even enroll in college. I'll find a useful but lucrative profession. And Victor successfully executed that plan. At Senor Prieto's insistence, he applied to the Polytechnic Institute in the same city where his adoptive parents lived. But after the first semester, the young man informed the Prieto family, I'm sorry, but I don't want to be an engineer. In fact, I've reconsidered many things in my life. Sonora Prieto was at a loss. Vico, what are you talking about? You're the most important thing in our lives. We're only working hard for you. The young man interrupted his adoptive mother. Sonora Prieto, don't deceive yourself or me. Everything you do is not for me, but for him, the one I've been replacing for so many years. I'm not upset with you, but I no longer want to be someone else. I believe I've earned the right to be myself. The Prietos looked at him with horror and pain. For a moment, Vico felt a deep sympathy for these people, but he knew well that things couldn't continue like this. Senor Prieto read a lot in his adoptive son's eyes. He asked quietly, Do you despise us now? Will you no longer come to us? The young man saw that penetrating gaze again, the one that had troubled his young heart back in the orphanage. Something stirred painfully in his soul. He embraced Senor Prieto. I will never forget what you have done for me. And there are no people closer to me in the whole wide world than you. Please, don't be upset with me, but I want to build my own life. But I will definitely visit you because you are my parents. In the Institute, Victor managed to establish useful connections, and one person from the faculty helped him get admitted to a college that trained specialists for the defense industry. The uniqueness of this form of education was that one could work and acquire a very rare profession at the same time. Housing was also provided to all employees of the enterprise on a rental basis. Ten years later, Victor already had his own one-bedroom apartment. Granted, his adoptive parents had helped with its purchase. And recently, he bought the car he had dreamed of for many years. As he neared his final goal, his excitement grew, and the man whispered, I wonder what awaits me in the town. Maybe I'll find my sister there. Thank goodness, I now know her details. Victor spent many years searching. He tried to find information about his sister through the orphanage where he spent less than three years, but initially, they outright refused to provide him any assistance, even when he asked for just the city where he had lived before. The lady in the office sternly looked at him and declared, We are not authorized to disclose confidential information. Vico tried to explain to the woman, You misunderstood me. I'm trying to find information directly related to me. I was six years old when my sister and I were separated, and now I want to find her. It seems like a normal desire. I'm simply asking you to help me a little. The woman hesitated for a long time, but eventually gave in. She glanced at her office door and then scribbled the name of the settlement on a scrap of paper. It's an urban type settlement. It's about 300 kilometers from here. Maybe someone there will be able to tell you where your sister is. Vico didn't waste any time and headed to the district town where the first years of his life had passed. When he arrived, his memory started to provide hints, and he easily found the dead-end street where he had lived with his mother. 
In place of their burned down house, there was now a vacant lot overgrown with weeds. Suddenly, an elderly woman approached him. Are you looking for someone? Maybe I can help you. The woman asked. You probably won't be able to help me. It's been over 20 years. I lived in a house that burned down, and I had a little sister. The woman grabbed her heart. Oh my goodness. Is it really you, Vico? Look at you, all grown up and handsome. The young man didn't expect such a strong reaction, and he said, somewhat embarrassed. Yes, it's me. You didn't mistake me. He tried to smile, but it didn't come out well, and he only grimaced as if he had eaten a lemon. The woman began to cry again. Your mother, Lucia, was so lost. It's a pity what happened to her. And your cousin took the little girl, Christina, with her. Do you know where she lives? The woman waved her hands desperately. How would I know? He was about to leave, but the woman stopped him. If you're going to see your grandma, she's been gone for a long time too. Outsiders bought the house. Talk to them. Maybe they'll give you some information about finding your sister. Victor continued on his way, but the woman caught up with him again. Getting old is no fun. I completely forgot. Go see Susanna. She definitely knows where the girl was taken. Victor was surprised that he had somehow forgotten about Aunt Susanna, who was almost always at his grandmother's house. But he found the distant relative's place of residence after wandering among the low-rise houses that predominated in this neighborhood. He climbed to the second floor and rang the doorbell of apartment number five. No one answered, and Vico was about to leave when he heard shuffling steps behind the door. Who is it? After a moment of hesitation, the man shouted, I'm looking for Aunt Susanna. Behind the door, another voice shouted, I don't have any nephews, and I don't open the door to skimmers. The footsteps started to fade away, and Vico had to shout a bit louder. Aunt Susanna, it's Vico, the grandson of Dania Delgado. You must remember me. The footsteps returned to the door. While the owner was struggling with the lock, a middle-aged man appeared from the neighboring apartment. Susanna is not in her right mind. Don't pay too much attention to her fantasies, otherwise she can come up with something that will blow your mind. Vico didn't have a chance to say anything because the neighbor's remark was interrupted by Aunt Susanna herself. However, the guest had a hard time recognizing in the bent old woman who was scolding her neighbor the same tall woman who often appeared in his grandmother's house. Aunt Susanna's disrespectful gesture was accompanied by insults directed at the man. It's you who don't know if he's coming or going, but I'm fine. My mind is perfectly fine. I don't siphon gasoline from neighbors' cars at night or living a tomcat life. The man's face turned red, and he slammed the door with a loud bang. But the vengeful old woman, fueled by a thirst for revenge, approached the neighbor's door and made an obscene gesture through the peephole. Satisfied with herself, she invited Vico into her apartment, where chaos reigned everywhere. Due to the disorder, the woman didn't even offer her guest a seat. They stood in the hallway, where she tried to examine him in the dim light of a low-power bulb. When the scrutiny was over, the old woman asked with undisguised irritation, Speak up, why have you come? Can't you see how I'm living? Nobody cares about me. Feeling that Aunt Susanna would soon redirect the conversation to her own personal problems, Vico told her about the purpose of his visit. The elderly woman immediately perked up. Why didn't you tell me right away that you're looking for Christina? After Nina took her away, we never heard anything about the girl. But if you want to find Nina, you'll have to search in the north. I don't remember the name of the city she wrote to me from, but I have a postcard from her, a greeting for International Women's Day. I'll get it for you now. The old woman hurried into the room and soon returned with a postcard. Take it, I don't need it. I haven't written letters to anyone in a long time. Vico took the postcard from Aunt Susanna's hands and quickly scanned the address. Judging by Aunt Susanna's resolute appearance, he understood that she wasn't going to display any miracles of hospitality. He took out two 100 euro bills from his wallet and handed them to the old woman. 
here, buy yourself something tasty. The old woman immediately broke into a smile, but she clenched the money in her fist. Vico, are you leaving already? Maybe we can have a cup of coffee together. But the young man politely declined the offer. After such a cold reception, he had no desire to have coffee with his relative and the condition of the apartment didn't contribute to a cultured leisurely time. Outside the entrance, he saw the neighbor whom his grandmother had insulted. The neighbor glanced at him. I thought you were from the authorities. Turns out, you're a relative. A very distant relative and perhaps not even a relative at all. I'm not sure. The man was disappointed with the answer. I thought maybe you'd take that crazy woman away and spare us from our troublesome neighbor. She's made our lives miserable. She sleeps during the day and watches the street at night. She's the one who thought I was siphoning fuel. Oh, and the worst part is that she insults people. Victor understood perfectly well what the man wanted from him, but he firmly said, Report it to the police or social services. They will definitely take action. The man was stunned. But she's your relative. Aren't you concerned about old lady? If I remember correctly, Aunt Susanna has children. Let them take care of her. He turned around and walked away from the courtyard, but the dissatisfied man's voice caught up with him. Keep raising kids like that, and they'll show you a finger when you're old. Vico smirked to himself, remembering how his grandmother Susanna gestured to the neighbor. Suddenly, a bitter lump formed in his throat. He recalled how he would stare out the window for hours, waiting for any relative to come visit him in the orphanage, but everyone had forgotten about him. And Aunt Susanna had never once acknowledged the existence of her grandnephew. Upon arriving at the address given to him by a relative, he was met with disappointment. His aunt and her family had moved to a new location 12 years ago due to her husband's new assignment. The thread was severed, and Vico didn't know what to do next. As he tried to gather his thoughts, an inner voice awakened, Turn to your father. He will help. Victor hadn't considered this option. He had kept hidden from his adoptive parents the fact that he had a younger sister. The reason for such mistrust dated back to his early childhood. He vividly remembered the day of the funeral when Aunt Nina said she didn't need the burden of a six-year-old boy, and he feared that if he revealed his sister to his adoptive parents, they would, at best, react without enthusiasm. Later, as Vico grew older, it became pointless to reveal the main secret to them. But finding himself at an impasse, the young man realized that his adoptive father's help could indeed yield positive results because Senor Prieto had connections even within the internal organs. His parents greeted him with sincere joy. Sonora Prieto couldn't shower enough love on him. Vico, thank you for coming. You have no idea how much we've missed you. Although Senor Prieto didn't display as much enthusiasm, it was still noticeable that he was brimming with positive emotions. Son, forgive me, but I can't believe you just showed up like this. After all the years you lived with us, I've learned all your gestures, and I can see that something is weighing heavily on you. Speak, why did you come? Victor briefly explained the essence of the problem, but the more he spoke, the more his father was astonished, and then he asked with concealed resentment. Why did you remain silent all this time? You should have told us earlier. We could have found your sister long ago. Are your mother and I such terrible people that you were afraid to confide in us? Vico felt ashamed of his past suspicions. Only now did he realize that despite everything, the people who raised him truly loved him, and he no longer held back. Please forgive me, but I used to think that you loved your son, not me. Tears welled up in Sonora Prieto's eyes. Just like in his childhood, she cradled his head against her chest. You've grown up, but you're still the same fool. Can one pretend to have non-existent love? Vico closed his eyes. He reveled in the warmth emanating from this woman. Emotions overwhelmed him, urging to be set free, and he softly pressed his lips to Sonora Prieto's hands and quietly requested, Mom, please forgive me. I'm really a complete idiot. Senor Prieto observed this touching scene from the side. 
For a moment, Vico thought he saw an unbidden tear shimmering in his eyes, but the man quickly regained control of his emotions. He cheerfully exclaimed, Well, as punishment for unworthy behavior, you'll have to stay with us for a whole week. I'm sorry, father, but only three days. I can't stay longer. I specifically took time off to find my sister, so every day counts. Ah, well, don't justify yourself. I'll try to gather some information during these days. Senor Prieto kept his promise. It took him only two days to find out Christina's whereabouts. Aunt Nina and her husband had adopted the girl, and now she even had a different surname, Sis. However, Vico wasn't sure if the holder of those personal details was indeed his biological sister, so he had to shorten his guest period at his adoptive parents' house. As they bid farewell, Senor Prieto asked, Vico, maybe I should have gone with you. No, father, it's not worth risking your health. The journey is long, and the heat is unbearable even for young people. I'll keep you updated and let you know when everything is resolved. All right, I'll hold you to your word. The next morning, Victor set off on his journey. The indicated city didn't leave a positive impression on Vico. This small provincial town lived its leisurely life. When he reached his destination, the midday heat gave way to a gentle evening coolness, and the locals casually went about their business. They cast sideways glances at the newcomer, but no one asked him anything. Vico decided to find accommodation first and asked a passing woman, Can you tell me where I can find a decent hotel around here? For some reason, the woman burst into laughter. We don't have hotels here, but there's a guest house over there, around the corner. He headed in the indicated direction and completed the registration in about 10 minutes. After leaving his belongings in a single room that the receptionist proudly called a luxe, the man decided to take a stroll. He was exhausted and hungry after a whole day, but the restaurant on the hotel's ground floor was fully occupied. The man cursed without anger, that's the province. Apparently, the locals enjoy spending their free time merrily. Vico looked around and noticed a food stall not far away, surrounded by people. He approached closer and immediately caught the unmistakable aroma of an eastern dish. His memory instantly responded to this familiar gastronomic scent. He remembered how, in his childhood, he used to stroll with his little sister and mother in the park, where they also sold shawarma. Back then, he had hopefully asked his mother, Mommy, it smells so delicious. Will you buy it for us? His mother gave his hand a painful tug. I don't have money for such delicacies. Eat what you're given and stop looking around. Vico still remembers how his mouth filled with saliva and his stomach growled loudly. His mother dragged him and his sister away from the kiosk where they sold the delicious treat, but he looked back and saw unfamiliar people eating that very shawarma and washing it down with Coca-Cola. Perhaps it was the memories of his unsatisfied childhood desires that awakened his ravenous appetite, and Vico ordered a double portion. The satisfied owner of the stall bustled around, anticipating a generous tip. He quickly prepared the order and wished the unfamiliar customer, Enjoy your meal. I make the most delicious shawarma. Today you'll eat here, and tomorrow you'll come back for more. Vico thanked the talkative entrepreneur and sat down at an empty table. However, it seemed he had overdone the order because he quickly became satiated with the calorie-rich dish. There was still an untouched second portion on the disposable plate. Vico was about to leave when he heard a timid voice nearby. Mister, if you're not going to eat that, can I have it? He abruptly turned and saw a thin girl, around six or seven years old. The little girl looked at the plate greedily, and that gaze made Vico slightly uneasy. Wait, little girl, why finish it? I'll order you a fresh portion right now. Just have a seat. I'll be right back. The thought of the girl finishing the shawarma in his presence bothered him. He rushed to the stall and asked the vendor. One. No, two portions, please. And a bottle of water. While he was at the kiosk, the girl sat obediently at the table, her eyes fixed on the plate of food. The owner himself brought the fresh portion. 
Please enjoy. The girl ate very neatly. She tried not to drop a single crumb, constantly wiping her fingers with a napkin. Vico thought that this little girl had been taught proper table manners, indicating good upbringing. Children from disadvantaged families usually don't possess such skills, but it would have been uncomfortable to pester the child with questions, so he waited for the right moment. His body became covered in perspiration due to inexplicable nervousness. Vico took out a handkerchief and began wiping his neck intensively. From a sudden movement, his pendant cross popped out. The girl stopped chewing and stared at the cross. Is that yours? Vico nodded. Yeah. I had a little sister, and our grandma baptized us together in the church. It's my most prized possession. I've been wearing it my whole life. Do you like it? Yes, I really like it. The girl carefully wiped her hands and delicately pushed the empty plate away. She looked at Vico and unexpectedly said, My name is Diana. Vico extended his right hand to her. Very nice to meet you, Diana. I'm Senor Vidal. I came here for a very important matter, but I got hungry and decided to grab a bite. Diana, do you live far away? Maybe I should walk you home. It's getting late and your parents might worry. The girl didn't respond. Vico interpreted her silence as a child's reluctance to reveal where she lived. Your mom probably doesn't allow you to talk to strange men, right? The girl nodded affirmatively. Your mom is right. It's the right thing to do because random encounters can be dangerous for little girls. Listen, let's do this. I'll go to the store, buy you something delicious, and you wait for me here. Deal? Once again, the girl nodded in agreement. The sign of a shopping center was shining nearby, and Vico headed in that direction. He quickly bought a small assortment of groceries and hurried back to the food stall, but the girl was no longer there. She must have run away after all. Vico looked at the table where he had recently indulged in culinary pleasure, but the plate with the uneaten shawarma was also empty. He realized that the girl had taken the leftovers with her. Poor thing, why did she run away? And what am I supposed to do with these groceries now? Slightly disappointed, Vico made his way back to the hotel and placed a bag of groceries in the refrigerator in his room. After a tiring day, he took a shower and lay down in bed. Sleep quickly overcame him, and all the good and bad thoughts dissolved, allowing him to rest. He was awakened by a cautious knock on the door. Sweet slumber didn't want to release him from its grip, and Vico checked the time and then looked out the window. Oh my, it's only half past seven. Who on earth would disturb me so early? Probably the chambermaid. The knock came again, and he had to get up. To his surprise, when he opened the door, he saw the little girl Diana from yesterday. The girl politely said, Good morning. The lady at the counter told me that you live here. The girl pointed toward the reception desk, giving it a new verbal interpretation. Vico had no choice but to invite the little guest into his room. You probably didn't come here just by chance, right? Diana looked at him with wide open eyes, and in that childlike gaze, Vico sensed something painfully familiar. The girl was also studying him attentively. After a long pause, she said, my mom sent me to you. She's really sick right now, so she can't come herself. And why did your mom send you to me? We don't even know each other. Vico found this absurd proposition somewhat amusing, but the little guest unexpectedly burst into tears. Mommy wanted to go by herself, but she suddenly felt really bad. She never used to get sick and went to work. We had lots of food, and on Sundays, Mommy always bought me ice cream. But now she can't even get up. What will happen if Mommy dies? Vico rushed to the child and tried to comfort her. Diana, please don't cry. I'll get ready quickly, and we'll go to your mom. You stay here for now. The man seated the still sobbing girl in a chair. He really wanted to distract her from sad thoughts. Listen, Diana, you ran away yesterday, but I bought a whole bag of food for you. You haven't had breakfast yet, right? 
Vico rushed to the refrigerator and pulled out the bag with a colorful design. Here, take a look at what's inside, and I'll freshen up quickly. For his morning routine, Vico spent no more than five minutes. When he returned to the room, his guest was enthusiastically devouring a muffin. Vico was once again struck by the girl's thinness, but cheerfully said, All right, I'm ready. Lead me to your mom. They wandered through the streets of the town for a while until they reached the outskirts, where small houses pressed against each other. The private sector of this town also evoked a sense of despair. Vico had never been thrown into such gloomy places by life before. For him, well-kept summer houses settlements were more familiar, whereas here, poverty screamed from almost every house. Diana took him by the hand. We live in an apartment in that building. The girl pointed her finger at a low-rise structure painted in dark blue. Contrary to the notions of harmony, the window frames were painted a toxic orange color. The unconventional palette made a strong impression on Vico, and he thought, how tasteless. Incredibly wild combination. But before he could express his opinion out loud, Diana beat him to it. Isn't it beautiful? My mom painted it. Our landlady asked her to, but she didn't give her money for the paint. Mom cried, and then Uncle Jamie brought us two buckets of paint. Vico nodded along, as he had no intention of memorizing the names of completely unfamiliar people to spare his brain from unnecessary load. He didn't ask who Uncle Jamie was, but the girl revealed the secret of this character herself. Uncle Jamie is our neighbor. He works at a construction site. He has a wife, Aunt Katya, who also helps us sometimes. They always feel sorry for mom because she's an orphan. And I'm an orphan too because I don't have a dad. Vico interrupted the girl. You have a mom, so you're not an orphan. At that moment, they reached the sagging gate, barely hanging on. The girl warned. Don't open it too wide, or it'll come off again, and there's no one to fix it. What about Uncle Jamie? You said he helps you. He helps, but not for free. And now we have no money, not even for bread, because mom doesn't work. As they wandered through the corners of the residential area, the sun had risen high in the sky, scorching the earth, and Vico was eager to escape the heat. But as soon as he crossed the threshold of the house, a strong stench hit his nose. Vico couldn't help but grimace. Diana looked at him understandingly and explained the origin of the unpleasant odor. I don't like the smell here either. Mom says that the house is infested with mold. But at least the landlady doesn't charge as much for the apartment. From somewhere in the distance, a woman's hoarse voice could be heard. Diana, did you come alone, or? Vico confidently stepped forward. No, you have guests. Vico walked from the dark hallway into a brighter, small room. Diana said that you wanted to see me, and I'm very curious about the reason for such interest in me. He stopped mid-sentence as eyes identical to Diana's peered out from under the blanket. But there was something else in the woman's ailing face that made him shudder. It was a noticeable scar above her right eyebrow. His little sister had the exact same mark. One time, their intoxicated mother couldn't hold onto the girl, and she cut her brow on the edge of a stool. They stared at each other for a long moment, then the girl's mother opened her palm, and Vico saw the same cross as his. Diana told me that the kind uncle who fed her had the same cross, so I asked her. The man immediately understood and rushed to the sick woman's bedside. Christina, sister, if you only knew how long I've been searching for you. The woman coughed heavily due to excitement. You're my brother? But Auntie never told me anything. I didn't even suspect that I had a brother. Another fit of coughing prevented the woman from speaking. Vico looked at her sympathetically, and then at Diana. We need to heal your mom first, and then we can talk. What do you think, Diana? The girl rushed to him. Are you mommy's brother? You won't leave? No, little one. I didn't search for you for so long just to leave right away. Besides, I can't abandon you in such a difficult situation. Diana, stay here with your mom. I'll be back soon. 
Vico headed to the neighboring house where, according to the girl, the kind Uncle Jamie lived, the one who had sold them discounted government paint. At the gate, a plump woman with a headscarf was already waiting for him. She gave Vico an appraising look. Whoa, a new bow for Christina? No, I'm her brother. Are men often visiting your neighbor? The woman rolled her eyes. God forbid, I've never seen any. Then why ask such questions? Oh, I was just thinking she's lonely, and here comes such a man. The neighbor was clearly being flirtatious, but Vico wasn't in the mood for compliments. Christina is very sick. Can you tell me how to call a doctor? The smile quickly vanished from the woman's face. I'll do it right away. The woman quickly ran down the path toward the house, but halfway there, she stopped. What's wrong with her? What are the symptoms? When you call an ambulance, they always ask about that. Tell them she has a severe cough and a fever. They waited for the medics for about an hour. The doctor gave the woman a critical look and, in a concerned voice, said, Rowls on both sides. Urgent hospitalization is needed. Despite the treatment that was started, Christina's condition remained serious. Vico had to stay in the stuffy little town because there was no one to leave little Diana with. When Christina's condition improved slightly, she told her brother her story. As she recounted her misfortunes, Vico's fists clenched tighter and tighter. Christina was not yet three years old when tragedy struck their family, so she had no memories of those meager moments that helped Vico find her. Their aunt took the girl with her to the other side of the world, where her husband worked. More precisely, Senor Ramos didn't work in the conventional sense. The man owned one of the mining enterprises. In the turbulent 90s, he managed to choose the right direction, and now he enjoyed all the benefits of life because the company consistently brought in income, ensuring the progressive growth of his family's personal wealth. The businessman agreed to adopt a completely unrelated girl, not out of compassion for the unfortunate child. He pursued an entirely different goal to create a positive image. Thus, he didn't hide this event from the public. On the contrary, he organized a grand celebration. Newspapers wrote about Senor Ramos's kind heart for a whole month, and it was talked about on television. In short, the PR campaign was successful, and the businessman's reputation only strengthened. He even congratulated his wife. Nina, you did great. You suggested such a brilliant idea. I would have never thought of it. Now I can confidently run for governor. Deep down, Sonora Ibanez was afraid of her husband because in their 15 years of marriage, he had displayed his despotic character more than once. She would have never dared to suggest taking in someone else's child, but she really liked the daughter of unruly Lucia. The woman didn't expect her husband to agree so quickly and hurried to arrange the paperwork. With her connections, she managed to expedite the process, but out of fear of angering her husband, Sonora Ibanez didn't tell him about the girl's family. The truth came out five years later. Christina would never forget that terrible scene when Senor Ramos yelled at his wife in anger. You have no idea how you betrayed me. What were you thinking when you took that girl from an alcoholic mother? We don't know how her bad genetics will manifest in the future. Sonora Ibanez tried to justify her actions. But Roma, the child isn't to blame for having such a mother. The man became even angrier. I don't give a damn about her. And don't try to soften me. This won't fly. But I demand that she never crosses my path again. The woman pleaded. Roma, but where am I supposed to put her? And so many years have passed. Take her to an orphanage and that's it. And if you have nothing to do, get a dog. That's what all the ladies from high society do, so follow their example. The woman tried to present her final and most compelling argument. Roma, imagine how delighted the yellow press will be when they find out that you abandoned an unfortunate child in an institution. They will talk about it for a year or even longer, and it will negatively affect your future career. Senor Ramos slumped into a chair, powerless. But you're right. I'm forced to admit it for the first time. Still, try to make sure the girl doesn't cross my path too often. 
Let her live outside the city, helping our housekeeper. At least there will be some use. The next day, Sonora Ibanez took the girl to a summer house settlement. Christina cried, and her foster mother first tried to soothe her affectionately, but then with irritation. Why are you crying? You're incredibly lucky to have ended up in good hands. Nothing will happen to you if you live in the settlement. There's a school there. You'll study, make new friends. For two months, Christina adjusted to life in her new surroundings. She was lucky that the housekeeper, Danya Herrera, treated her well. Every month, her adoptive parents would come to the summer house on weekends, and then Christina would move to the annex. That's what Senor Ramos ordered. But life had more trials in store for the orphan. She was around 10 years old when Danya Herrera casually said, You poor thing, Christina. Why do all these troubles fall upon your unfortunate head? The girl froze with a sense of foreboding. Auntie, did something happen to my mother, Nina? Something did happen. They will have their own little baby now. Christina was too young to understand what the arrival of another baby in the businessman's family meant for her. But she didn't remain ignorant for long. Unexpectedly, in the middle of the week, Senor Ramos himself appeared and ordered the housekeeper. Camila, get the girl ready. I'll take her with me to the city. The woman hurried to carry out the order. The man looked at the girl unkindly. Hmm, you've grown up. It's time to repay the money spent on you. You'll look after your brother. Christina was afraid to move, but she still asked. What about school? They promised to submit my drawings to a competition. Senor Ramos burst into laughter. He laughed until tears streamed down his face and even patted Christina on the head. Thanks for making me laugh. It lifted my spirits a bit. I didn't even know that there was a budding talent in my house. Another Malovich is growing up. And now, seriously, of course, you will go to school, but I won't promise you any other hobbies. Christina had never been particularly happy in life, but she never thought that her existence could turn into a true nightmare. Little Emmanuel was only three months old, but he was a healthy and robust baby. The baby had a demanding temperament and required to be carried all the time. For a teenage girl, it became an unbearable responsibility. Her back and arms were in pain. One day, she complained to Sonora Ibanez. Emmanuel is so heavy that I can't lift him. Sonora Ibanez glared at her foster daughter with anger. Why did you say that now? Do you think I will sympathize with you? You like to eat for free, but you don't want to take care of your brother? Well, you won't get away with it. After Emmanuel's birth, Sonora Ibanez's attitude towards the girl changed significantly. If she had occasionally shown pity and compassion before, now she constantly yelled at Christina and sometimes resorted to violence. Once, the girl stayed late at school because they had an event dedicated to Women's Day. She had prepared a gift for Sonora Ibanez, a small paper box. Christina had decorated the souvenir herself. Everyone in her class admired her work, and even the teacher said, What a delight! Your mother will be thrilled. But when Christina met Sonora Ibanez at the door, her expression did not bode well. Where have you been? You were almost two hours late, and I had an appointment at the beauty salon. The girl handed her mother the unique gift. We had a celebration at school. We congratulated our mothers. This is a gift for you. Sonora Ibanez threw the box on the floor and began stomping on it. I don't need your gifts. Take your box to your late mother's grave. Let her enjoy it in the afterlife. Christina rushed to save her creation, but the enraged woman roughly pushed her aside. The girl hit the door frame and cried out in pain. Sonora Ibanez leaned over her. Why are you screaming? You will wake the baby. Emmanuel started crying in the child's room, and Christina had to go and calm him down. She cried all day, her heart filled with hatred for the boy who had turned her life into a living hill. In the evening, Sonora Ibanez entered her room. If you're late again, I'll kick you out of this house. Do you understand me? Christina whispered quietly. 
Yes, mommy. And stop calling me mommy. You're just a burden to me. Luckily, I have my own biological son. That was the final verdict for Christina's future. Since there was no help to expect from anyone, she began contemplating how to escape from this slavery. Of course, she couldn't even dream of going to college. The businessman had decided her fate when her education in school was approaching its final stage. You'll go to college and get some kind of profession. Nina, see if you can find a place for the girl where she can become self-sufficient as soon as possible. It's time for her to earn her own bread because she has been freeloading for too long in our house. Sonora Ibanez arranged for Christina to attend a vocational college for painters. Painting is a profitable profession. If you're not foolish, you'll always have money. They have well-equipped dormitories there. You'll receive a student's payments. Sonora Ibanez made it clear that Christina was no longer welcome in their home. Even Emmanuel, who had grown up in her arms, openly mocked her. People like you belong on construction sites or in the trash. I'm going to be a businessman because my dad has endless money. Christina didn't want to argue with the spoiled little brat. Soon, she packed her things and moved into the college dormitory. Contrary to her anxious expectations, an interesting life awaited her within the walls of the educational institution. There were constantly engaging events and interest clubs. Christina immediately joined the art studio, where a young master named Senor Ortega noticed her talent. Despite only working at the school for a year, the young man had already gained a legion of admirers. Girls deliberately attended the studio to have the opportunity to interact with the attractive master. Christina secretly sighed as well, but she was afraid to even consider the possibility of reciprocated feelings from Senor Ortega. Although the young teacher behaved according to his status, he didn't shy away from the company of girls. He tried to give attention to all his admirers, but it never developed into serious relationships. The girls in the group side, lamenting their fate. The one who captures Cornelio's heart will be so lucky. His mother also teaches at the institute, and his father holds a high position somewhere. Christina also sighed secretly, but she never engaged in such discussions. The girl cherished those rare minutes and hours that Senor Ortega dedicated to her personally. Christina's artworks were sent to regional exhibitions, where they always took top prizes. The master of vocational training felt obligated to refine the talent of his protege to perfection. One day, he stayed back after class with Christina. Christina, I have a proposition for you. Would you like to have individual lessons with me? I would love to. That's the right attitude. You have certain abilities, but they need to be developed into talent. I must confess, I have also become passionate about painting, and I have my own studio, my father splurged on it. So, I can spend extra time with you during my free hours. The girl became saddened. But Senor Ortega, I have no way to pay for such lessons. The young man exclaimed with enthusiasm. I'm an altruist. Don't even think about money. It was a magical time. Christina rushed to Cornelio's studio every evening after classes in college. At first, they focused solely on their art, but one day the master himself suggested taking a stroll before bedtime. They went to the movies together, and once, the man even invited her to a restaurant. The naive girl knew nothing about the pitfalls of courtship. She thought Cornelio was charmed by her and that he would soon propose, so she agreed to continue the evening at his studio after the restaurant. The champagne glass clouded her judgment, and she melted in the arms of an experienced seducer. After that unforgettable night, Senor Ortega became more persistent in his pursuit of the girl. He gave her flowers and small gifts. Mendelssohn's wedding march played in Christina's ears as she was suddenly awakened. After two months of secret meetings in the studio, the girl realized that she was pregnant. She expected Cornelio to be overjoyed with the news, but the man held his head in his hands. Christina, how could you let this happen? You're not a naive young lady who doesn't know about contraception. The girl was taken aback. But I really didn't know. And I thought you would be happy. What happiness? What are you thinking, babe? 
Did you really think I would marry you? I'm sorry, but I already have a fiancé, and we're getting married this summer. Cornelio, what about me? What should I do? That's not my concern. Ask the girls in your group. They'll tell you where to go, but don't come to me anymore. And, in general, we need to stop these meetings. It took some time for Christina to fully comprehend the meaning of her beloved's words. Deep down, she still hoped he would change his mind and call her, but Senor Ortega deliberately avoided her. And soon, her studies at college came to an end. Christina didn't share her plight with any of her classmates. She decided to seek help from Senor Ibanez, but when her foster mother found out about her situation, she didn't even allow her into the house. I knew it. I had a gut feeling that this would happen. Can a good plant grow from bad seed? Go, Christina, and deal with your own problems. I have enough to deal with, even with just Emmanuel. The girl was desperate. She didn't know what to do or how to proceed. Unexpectedly, she remembered the housekeeper, Dania Herrera, and took the risk of going to her outside the city. Although the woman wasn't known for her kindness, she sheltered the pregnant girl. I won't refuse to help you because that wouldn't be Christian. But I warn you, behave quietly and don't bring anyone into my house. You understand that you don't belong in the world of businessmen, and while my house isn't luxurious, it's a livable place. Christina lived with Dania Herrera until the birth of her daughter. They didn't have financial problems because Christina earned money by doing repairs at private summer houses. One day, Dania Herrera came up with a good idea. I have a childhood friend who lives in a town up north. I want to move there in my old age. If you're interested, come with me. I'm sure you'll find work there, and I'll take care of Diana. I've grown attached to the girl, and to you too. You've become like family to me. Soon, they moved to a small town, but Dania Herrera didn't live long in a new place. The climate turned out to be detrimental to her health, and she passed away unexpectedly about a year later, leaving Christina alone with her young child once again. The friend of her deceased benefactor wasn't as compassionate, but she didn't kick out the single mother and her child onto the streets. She offered Christina favorable rental conditions for a semi-dilapidated house, which the girl was grateful for. As Vico listened to his sister's story, he experienced a range of emotions, but now he understood that he was luckier than this fragile woman who resembled a teenager. Exhausted from her emotions and the long conversation, Christina struggled to breathe. He leaned over her. It's all behind us now, little sister. We'll be together from now on. He pulled out his cross from under his shirt and kissed it. I'm amazed at the foresight of the elderly. If our grandmother hadn't wanted us to be baptized back then, we probably wouldn't have found each other. Did you notice the engraving on the other side? Christina smiled weakly. Yes, my name is engraved there. I discovered it for the first time before I even started school, but I didn't show my cross to Sonora Ibanez. I was afraid she would take it away from me. She never told me anything about you and our grandmother. As they talked, Diana played with her dolls. Victor gave her two dolls with sets of clothes, and the girl was ecstatic with such a gift. Wow. Now I have two friends. The other girls will be jealous. In addition to the toys, Victor also bought a tracksuit and a beautiful dress for the girl. The new clothes delighted her as well. Uncle Vico... Do you have a lot of money to spend on us? I enjoy spending on such wonderful girls. I'll let you in on a secret. When we get home, I'll buy you so much clothing that it won't fit in the closet. Diana squealed with delight while Christina asked with concern. Do you want to take us with you? Her older brother became serious. Christina, let's make an agreement that from this day forward, you won't ask me any silly questions. Do you really think that after searching for you for so long, I would just leave? You can't even imagine how all these years I prayed to God or maybe angels, I don't remember, but my main dream was to find you. Christina smiled, and a hint of blush appeared on her exhausted face. Vico, I'll listen to you in everything. I also want to confess to you that even now, I'm afraid to believe in my happiness. 
The Prieto couple was getting ready to go to the city market when the doorbell rang. Sonora Prieto looked at her husband suspiciously. Nikita, who could that be? Or are your domino playing friends here again? The man persistently denied that version. Why do you always assume it's me? Maybe it's one of the neighbors who came for salt or someone running out of laundry detergent. Stop looking at me like that. Open the door. Grumbling, Sonora Prieto headed to the hallway, but immediately a scream was heard. Vico, as always, you come without warning. Your father and I were just about to leave for the market. Senor Prieto also went out to greet the long-awaited guest. Victor entered the apartment. Dad, Mom, I'm not alone. Christina, Diana, don't be afraid, come in. So you finally found your sister? Well done. You've done a truly courageous act. The arrival of guests startled the couple, but Sonora Prieto was the most active. What market now? We need to send the men to get groceries, and we'll prepare delicious and nutritious food. Didi, will you help Grandma Josefa? Yes, I always help my mom, and I even know how to peel potatoes. Excellent. But I won't give you a sharp tool yet. You'll be our little assistant. And you, Christina, don't hesitate. Get used to it. We are now one family. A year passed. Indeed, Christina and Diana found a real family. Victor wanted to settle them in his apartment, but the adoptive parents didn't want to let go of the girls. They had become so attached to them that they couldn't imagine life without them. Let them live with us. We've already found a school for Diana, and we'll find work for Christina. Senor Prieto took it upon himself to help Christina find a job. She started working as a restaurant worker at a historical site. There, the young woman met an artist who soon proposed to her. In short, everyone's life fell into place, except for Victor, who continued to live a bachelor's life, but he knew that the most interesting part was still ahead of him. The angels just hadn't sung his song yet. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.